today I'll be telling you about Love's Labour's Lost, a play which is a marvellous early 1590s contribution to Shakespeare's canon. This play is premised on the Aristotelian notion that no matter how close a man was to a woman, no relationship with a woman could ever approximate the depth and intimacy and intellectual pleasure of a man's relationship with another man. This fit in with so many of the inherited beliefs about women. Firstly, that they were intellectually uh, subordinate to men. Um, secondly, that even their sex organs indicated that they were incomplete men because they didn't in the womb develop the attributes of male physiognomy. And thirdly, that so many women for so long had been kept illiterate and with illiteracy is a lack of power. Now this had all begun to change with the inventing of the printing press where many women previously illiterate had learned to read and with education comes confidence and the belief that one has the power to contribute to the public discourse. So all of this controversy about women underlies this wonderful, in a way, spoof called Love's Labour's Lost. Here's the context. The King of Navarre with his three gentlemen have retreated from the magnificent castle of Navarre to the parks, the grand parks beyond, where they are going to camp out and um, explore deeply the world of the intellect. And in so doing, they are going to avoid the frivolities and distractions of the flesh, namely women and food. So here they are preparing for this ascetic life but they run into the Princess of France and her gentlewomen who have come to Navarre to request the province of Aquitaine, which is still under the control of the King of Navarre, but which needs to be returned to the King of France. So the princess's job is to persuade the King of this and to negotiate for it. So these women have a serious purpose. They meet the men and quickly get a sense of who these men are and how um, ridiculous is their conceit. And they begin this process of mockery, which is hilarious and which actually captivates and enchants the men. One little example of this is when one of the men praises the princess for her beauty and she says my beauty though but mean needs not the painted flourish of your words so um, in other words um, don't bother trying to butter me up by saying how beautiful I am because I don't need the confidence that you think that gives me now I find this fascinating because of firstly who is in the audience Queen Elizabeth I. She loved this play because it showed a regal woman who was not about to have to bow down to male beliefs and requirements. Elizabeth herself had been asked to marry many times over her decades on the English throne and had always resisted. She had not provided an heir, but she had also resisted having to give power to a male consort. I also find it fascinating because of where it's written in the canon. So we had, um, for instance, Taming of the Shrew, in which Petruchio, in pursuit of Caterina, makes a lame attempt to praise her for her renowned beauty. And she says something like, Tosh, get out of here, don't be absurd. But then also, that intriguing line in Romeo and Juliet 
that's a play also written close to this one where Paris says to Juliet after she's been weeping, poor soul, thy face is much abused by tears. And Juliet replies, the tears have got small victory then, for it was bad enough before their spite. So even though she's been elevated over the centuries as this beautiful, innocent, captivating woman um, who also has a lot of intelligence, here she is saying, I don't cast much favor for my beauty. I am other than how you want to see me physically. So Shakespeare was obviously really intrigued at the moment at this particular moment by how women were valued and how they learned to value themselves. So here we have this relationship between the men and the women in Love's Labour's Lost and the men's attempts to use age-old um, truisms in winning the women the women's mockery and jokes which actually teaches the men to value them for their minds and not just their beauty to see them as wonderful avatars for the intellect which the men had previously thought women were the opposite of so how fascinating is this that they all agree yes finally that they are in love with each other and this uh, love which goes quite deep is highlighted by the arrival in Act 4 by a character called Holofernes who is a teacher and gives us the longest word in the English language honorific abilitude in etatibus. The ridiculousness of this word goes along with the ridiculousness of the ideal of learning for learning alone. Learning, knowledge, intellect is only useful in this world as we use it to make a better world, a world in which we think more deeply about ourselves and others rather than as of the brain as something separate that needs to be coddled and secured away from the pleasures of the flesh. Well, near the end of the play, the plans to wed are all overturned because a messenger comes in and tells them that the King of France has died. The princess must immediately return to take charge of the affairs of France. So the wedding has to be deferred for a year for all the parties. And so the play has done a kind of somersault. First of all, the princess has achieved her aim of securing Aquitaine because she will soon be wedded to the king. So the princess has that um, to take home with her. But also this pause in the relationship that is necessitated by something very important, the running of national affairs, can't help but be contrasted with the ridiculous vow of celibacy with which the play has begun. So the women win on all scores. They win not just the men's heart, but the true value and meaning of what it means to be human in this rapidly changing world that was moving from feudalism to capitalism in which men had to take women seriously and women were entitled to think the same of themselves. This would all be challenged again early in the 17th century by the Puritans' rabid wish to keep women under wraps to deprive them of power. And women have had a struggle over the years. I mean, it's incredible to think that it's 100 years only since women in America had the vote. But we're getting there. And love's labor's lost 
is a loving labor on this journey to true equity.